good afternoon. My name is uh, Gilles Vernier. I'm, uh, uh, I teach uh, political science at Ashoka University and uh, as a co-director of the uh, Trivedi Center for Political Data, uh, I uh, welcome you warmly to this uh, third installment of uh, the CPRTCPD dialogue on uh, Indian politics. We are particularly excited with uh, the panel that we have uh, today, uh, which is dedicated on the question of settling a research agenda uh, for the uh, 2019 elections. While uh, the title may seem a little bit technical, it seemed to us important that uh, as we are in the wake of a very big and arguably very important electoral year, it would be good to uh, start by reflecting on what kind of questions uh, should we ask, uh, reflect also about how do we cover elections as journalists, as academics, and, um, and think about ways uh, elections ought to be uh, covered in, in ways that maybe have uh, not been um, done so, done so uh, in the past. Uh, I will leave the floor immediately to uh, my esteemed uh, colleague and friend Yamini Eya to introduce you with uh, the, the, the panelists and uh, hope that you will uh, enjoy the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gilles, and thank you, everyone, for, for being here this afternoon uh, for what promises to be a, a very exciting conversation. Uh, just uh, a, a little bit of background to, uh, to, to take forward what Gilles said, both about the series and today's discussion. One of the re uh, reasons we uh, sort of came together to, to start thinking about a series like this is that we also felt that especially in the last few years and perhaps more in the last year, public discourse on politics has reached a point where it's so deeply polarized that any serious nuanced conversation that in fact un goes behind the, the, the rhetoric and tries to understand what is going on in India has become almost impossible. And likely over the next few months, it's going to get uglier and sharper um, and yet, India is going through what seems to be a, a rapid and critical transformation, uh, both uh, uh, in terms of its society and naturally our politics is a reflection of that. Yet, every time we talk about uh, where we are today, we tend, to f uh, we tend to find that public debate pushes you into categories. You're either with us or against us, national or anti-national, left or right. Uh, whereas what we really need is a more careful understanding of what is happening. And sometimes that understanding also requires us to go back in history. And so we felt that a space uh, like this is important and crucial, especially in the run-up to the elections, where we can bring together observers, practitioners, researchers, participants in the political process to, uh, to talk about topical, critical political issues that face the country and which will be at the forefront of the public debate as we head into the whirlwind of the elections. Today's discussion has particularly been uh, thought from the perspective of how a group like ours and, and many of you, or all of you in this room who study Indian politics, who report on Indian politics, uh, can really begin to start interpreting what's going to happen in the next six, six months to a year. To ask ourselves what are the kinds of questions that we should have at the back of our minds as we cut through the noise to interpret what is happening on the ground and, and think about and interpret elections. Also, I might add that I think sometimes political scientists have increasingly become quantitative data specialists. So you get a lot of data with a lot, very little explanation of what goes lies beneath that data. So we also hope that a discussion like this will get us will get us really to the heart of what the study of politics is about, about party structures, about forms of mobilization, and about how the transitions and changes of society get reflected in these, and ultimately what that means then for the kinds of uh, outcomes you see in elections. I'm really, really delighted and particularly honored uh, to uh, be able to, to have with me such a fantastic panel. And it's a real privilege for me to, uh, to be ho hosting all of you in my new capacity as president of CPR. I don't think 
we've met here um, in this capacity. So, I, uh, so this is a particularly special moment from, for me. Uh, none of my panelists need much introduction, but, uh, but we'll go through that motion in any case. On my right is uh, Professor Ashutosh Varshne, who is a Seoul Goldman Professor of International Studies and, and, uh, and Social Sciences and Professor of Political Science in Brown University. He is also one of the most uh, uh, careful and nuanced commentators uh, um, in the public space on, uh, on contemporary po political affairs today. On my left here is uh, Aditi Fadnis, who is a political editor of the Business Standard and has set the gold standard, I think, for how one should be thinking about political reporting. Um, and even in our conversation preceding uh, this panel discussion, in the 20 minutes we spoke on the phone, I learned so much more from her about what's happening. And further to the left is Professor Pradeep Chibber, who is Professor uh, and Indo-American Community Chair in India Studies and Director of the in Institute of International Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Chibber, too, has been uh, uh, you know, one of the few political scientists who've been using a lot of data to really get us to understand pa party structures and forms of mobilization. And his latest book that was discussed two day, uh, day before yesterday, I think, uh, uh, has a lot of important insights, which I think will contribute a lot to how we look forward uh, into the 2019 election. So let me begin uh, by uh, asking Ashu to uh, sort of set the frame for the conversation. Ashu is going to go back a little bit into history and uh, also bring, uh, br bring the sort of roots of democratic theory into the conversation for us to start thinking about what our research agenda should look like. Over to you. Uh, thanks, uh, Yamini. <clears throat> Always a pleasure to be here at CPR. And uh, uh, my task is not to focus um, especially on 2019 elections and its, uh, its details, but to, uh, I've been asked to present India in a comparative historical theoretical perspective. So um, a very large proportion of my profession uh, deals with democracy. And therefore, there is a whole body of literature on what um, uh, a theoretical literature on uh, what is a democracy, what is a good democracy, what is a not so deep democracy, etc. And on that, uh, and I will be presenting India in that light. And the uh, basic argument, as is summarized here, India is electorally vibrant, but India is not a very uh, robust el uh, liberal democracy. So let's get to what elements of modern democratic theory are relevant to discussion of India. And here is, uh, there are two kinds of requirements right away which we should keep in mind. The minimum requirement is electoral, and it's defined as uh, a contestation and participation, essentially meaning that uh, uh, incumbent governments, which have a lot of power, should be freely contested in elections by opposition uh, parties. And the participation, which is franchise, franchise should be universal. No one should be excluded on the ground of gender, caste, race, etc. So that's the minimum requirement. There's a broader requirement that takes democracy from the electoral <coughs> dimension to, to the non-electoral dimensions, and that's summed up typically as liberal freedoms between elections. And especially three uh, freedoms are mentioned uh, in this vast literature, freedom of expression, freedom of religious practice, and freedom of association. In addition to these two uh, very widely known uh, theoretical uh, points, there is also uh, literature which talks about income and democracy. And uh, as democracies uh, can be established at low levels of income, but they only survive at high levels of income, or they normally not only, uh, I correct myself, they normally survive at high levels of income is a standard canon of democratic theory. On who votes, the standard can canon of democratic theory is the richer and the more educated the voter, the higher the odds of voting. It comes from a very vast amount of literature based on the West. Uh, the Huntington point, we can, in the interest of time, we have just 12 minutes, so I'll, remo I'll now talk about the Huntingtonian point of democratic consolidation. So here is some basic data. Most of you would know this, uh, but it's worth summarizing about India's electoral vibrancy since 1952, 16 national elections, 366 state elections. Since 1992, 3 million local legislators elected every five years, one-third women by law. 
power has changed hands eight times in Delhi and tens of times at the state level. The reason at this particular point is important is that, uh, now let's get back to Samuel Huntington. The democratic consolidation point is that the minimum condition for democratic stability, minimum condition, not the maximum condition, is the two turnover principle. That is to say, incumbents today lose elections and they bow out and the opposition comes to power. And when the opposition loses the election, it also bows out. Once you have these two turnovers and those, the incumbents who have a lot of power, do not unduly or illegitimately exercise power and block the arrival of those who won the elections, that's when democratic consolidation begins, is the idea. Uh, the assumption here is the incumbents can really misbehave, and in many parts of the world they have blocked those who won the elections from running government, right? So that's, that's the basic idea here. And so power has changed hands eight times in Delhi and tens of time, eight times at the state level. We don't count that anymore. That means the Huntingtonian principle has been satisfied four times over in Delhi itself. In 1952, 81 million votes were cast. In 2014, nearly 555 million votes were cast. Turnouts now routinely in excess of 60%. Highest was 66%, lowest 55%, uh, something is uh, clipped here. But 60% but, but in, in democracies where vote is not compulsory, it's voluntary, is fairly high, comparatively speaking. Uh, until 1989, following mainstream democratic theory, the richer and more educated citizens used to vote more than the poorer and the less educated. Since 1989, defying democratic theory, the poor and the less educated have voted as much as, if not more than their more fortunate co-citizens. And this particular finding we actually attribute to Lok Niti today and the Yogendra Yadav team that was built there. Their repeated empirical exploration of, voter, of, of, of voting data generated this, uh, this argument. And now it's accepted, part of the accepted canon on India's electoral behavior. Election finance is the single biggest weakness of India's election protests, as we, election process, as we discussed two days ago at, at the South Asia conclave. But it's clear that while business finances elections often illegally, they are unable to determine election outcomes. The argument uh, two days back was that even today, the richer, the richer candidates has a higher probability of winning, but he's not guaranteed to win. And the richer party is not guaranteed to win. Hmm? And, and, and so poorer elect political parties can win. Have won Aam Aadmi Party in Delhi in 2013-2015, SP in UP in 2012, BSP in UP in 2007. Actually, it was, it was the poorest party of the four in 2007 uh, in UP. Um, and, and it won. And, and Mayawati won hand, hands down. Now, so... Um, so then, it, this is a theoretically surprising resilience. The science is now, is, there's a consensus that India is a very surprising case of democratic resilience. Let me just go through the steps of that, that argument then. Uh, so as I said, contemporary democratic theory believes that democracies can be established at low levels of income, but they survive not only, this is to be corrected, primarily or normally at high levels of income. There is a great affinity between wealth and democracy, comparatively speaking. In the West, universal franchise was introduced only after societies became rich, after industrial revolutions had taken place, basically by the 19-teens and 1920s. And India, by this, in this historical comparative perspective, is the longest surviving lower income universal franchise democracy in history. India is a lower middle income country now, has been for about 10 years, but for the, for the preceding 60 years, it was a low-income country, an LIC, according to the World Bank, not lower middle. Um, they had a summary of the most systematic statistical analysis that we have of, uh, of uh, the relationship between income and democracy, Adam Shavosky and his colleagues at NYU at New York University. The data set covered 141 countries between 1950 and 1990. Income turned out to be the best predictor of democracy. It correctly predicted the type of regime in 77.5% 70, of the cases. Only in 22.5% it did not. No other predictor, religion, colonial legacy, ethnic diversity, international political environment was as good as income on the whole. India, obviously, is in the latter 22.5% set. Indeed, if we consider only decolonized countries, democracies that emerged from decolonization survived only in the following countries. India, Mauritius, Belize, Jamaica, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. That is the list of post-colonial democratic longevity. That is the list. Hmm? 
Uh, in the most surprising cases, India, argue Shavorsky, etc., the odds against democracy in India are extreme, were extremely high. All other poorer exceptions that we listed have higher income than India, and one might just note parenthetically that some other countries have defied the pattern on the obverse side. If India is the biggest exception on the low income end, Singapore is the biggest surprise on the high income end. Singapore's per capita income is now $52,000. It's $10,000 more than Germany, France, and Britain. Um, and at that level of income, no non-oil-rich country is undemocratic. And Singapore uh, has had elections, but no democratic theory, so no student democracy calls Singapore a democracy. Hmm? Um, now, to the liberal deficits. Seven minutes. Yeah? Now, there's vast literature on, on what the liberal side of democracy, that's the electoral side that we've summarized, what the liberal side of democracy is. And uh, there are, of course, many liberalisms. Uh, as political scientists in the room would know. But across the various the voluminous literature, there's agreement that at least three are common to all, all variants. One is freedom of expression between elections, including elections, but also between elections, freedom of religious practice, and freedom of association. And these three freedoms are typically enshrined in constitution and laws, and they lead to limited government. The elected government is not free to do anything it wants. It's constitutionally constrained, and the constraints, these three freedoms constrain it through constitutional means. So these freedoms are especially important, as we know, for democracy between elections. We know that, but why might that be? So why are they important between elections? Once the thresholds of contestation and participation, that is the electoral dimension, are satisfied, a democracy can attain higher quality, or to use Robert Dahl, the most famous democratic the theory, theorist of democracy after the Second World War, it can become deeper. If liberal freedoms between elections are available, that is to say if citizens are free to speak, free to associate, and free to practice their faith. Thus, we cannot have a democracy without free elections, but a democracy would be deeper if non-electoral dimensions of freedom, not simply free vote, were also made available. Uh, India's record on these freedoms is not as strong as the electoral record. Liberal freedoms, though not absent, appear not to be robustly anchored. Threats repeatedly appear, especially true at the present time. So let's summarize that in the next three minutes. Um, India is freest at the time of elections. Short of inciting violence, virtually any argument can be made in election campaigns. And um, uh, Chief Election Commissioner is, former Chief Election Commissioner is here. He can testify that the only, only speech, can, un unless it incites violence, any form of speech that, that, that uh, politicians use is fine, unless it incites violence. Hmm? But once an elected government takes over, restrictions on basic liberal liberties are often placed. Intellectuals, writers, artists, students, NGOs can face harassment on grounds that they hurt the sentiments of certain groups or undermine national interest. In a multi-religious society, which has also had a deeply hierarchical system for centuries, some group or the other can always claim to be hurt. And when group injury is claimed, governments rarely support the writer, rarely support the intellectual, rarely support the artist, rarely support the NGO. This is actually a generic problem. It's common to all kinds of government. Rushdie's satanic verses are banned by the Congress party because of Muslim rights protest. Also under Congress party, M.F. Hussain, a leading painter, had to migrate because of Hindu right protest. But these problems become especially serious when Hindu nationalists come to power, as is true today, because of two things. Minorities get automatically added to the list of targets, not simply writers and artists. A Hindu-centric view of the nation leads to that. India for Hindu nationalists is a Hindu nation, which is a fundamentally unconstitutional idea. It's not supported by the Constitution of India. And second, a muscular nationalism threatening to exclude dissenters also comes into being, which leads to not, on, not only attacks on minorities, but also attacks on liberal critics and dissenters. Hmm? So there, there is twofold threat that emerges, which, is, which, which won't when, the, when, non, when Hindu nationalists are not in power, when other groups are in power, Hindu nationalists bring two additional dimensions to, to, to the working of, of... Now, there's an argument about why Hindu nationalism is illiberal. We can leave this out. We, can, we don't have time. The, only, uh, the, the, the new point that is emerging, which is populism, the, the Hindu nationalism of uh, Atal Vihari Vajpayee regime 
was not fundamentally populist. Yes, there was vigilante action against uh, priests and Christian priests, Christian church, church uh, one church at least, I think two, in Odisha, etc. Uh, but uh, but uh, the Hindu nationalism of, of NDA since 2014 has a populist variety, has a populist tone to it. So we need to think about briefly what, are, what is populism, what are the key ideas. So the key ideas are democracy is primarily about elections, if not entirely. The customary institutions of oversight, the judiciary, the press, the intelligence agencies, which normally constrain democratic governments between elections, must follow electoral verdicts, not the law or the institutionally assigned roles. They equate uh, electoral majorities with popular will, they infuse it with moral fervor. This is not simply true of what's happening here. It's true of Viktor Orban. It's, it's true of Erdogan. It's true of Trump's populism. Um, calling opposition often, uh, opposition to electoral majority, immoral, malevolent, anti-national, anti-this, etc. Hmm? Some leaders, this is a very important point of populism, authentically represent the people and the masses, while others are corrupt and moral crooks to be tamed by the state and mass, mass hysteria which essentially means vigilantism often goes along with populism. And we can discuss this about uh, the, uh, its Im implications of this uh, in India. Why vigilantism, first of all, why vigilantism goes along with populism, uh, generally speaking, and what are specific Indian manifestations. Um, here is a, a very interesting quote by Ram Madhav. About, I wrote against that in my column. Ram Madhav in his column on 15th August last year, wrote, uh, summed up Modi's appeal thus, the mob, the humble people of the country are behind Modi, they're enjoying it, unquote. And here is the point that comes from democratic theory. A populist can celebrate mob rule, but a democrat cannot. He knows that mobs are not always right. Untouchability was popular in India, as was lynching of blacks in American South. That is why all modern democracies constrain mob sentiments with constitutions and laws. A conflation of mobs in democracy only leads to frequent vigilante violence or an emasculation of civil society and a weakening of law-based governance. And this is why populist democracy can be called populist democracy, but it's not constitutionally derived or liberal democracy. That would be the, the big difference. You can change the constitution and then you can say if the constitution becomes populist, then it's also constitutionally derived. Right? So to summarize then. India's democratic credentials are not in doubt. At India's level of income, no democracy has ever survived for seven decades. But India has done much better as an electoral democracy, substantially less well as a liberal democracy. India's record as a liberal democracy plunges to dangerous levels when Hindu nationalism comes to power and it takes a majoritarian populist form. The latter begins severely to erode the constitutional liberal protections for citizens, especially the protections provided by constitutions, liberal constitutions to minorities. Thank you. Thank you for that fantastic uh, tour de force into democratic theory and uh, placing India's democracy and democratic practice in that context. And I think it's an important reminder of what's right with our democracy and where, where the challenges lie. Um, uh, Pradeep, can I turn to you now? Uh, you know, you, you made the powerful point about the role of ideology in, uh, in, in forms of party mobilization and voter behavior. Um, and I think linking it back to one of the, more, uh, uh, the points that Ashu made about the changing nature of Hindu nationalism and the populism, uh, the, the populist characteristic of Modi's uh, 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 notion of Hindu nationalism, how has that evolution taken place? What are its implications? You know, how, how does one trace this back to uh, uh, shifting social structures, party behaviors, and what what should that mean for us as we look forward into 2019? Uh, thank you, much. Uh, thank you for calling me. I've never been to CPR before, so this is the first. Yeah, so there we are. So thank you. You may not call me again after I'm done, so that's you know that'll be even better. I actually uh, misunderstood the brief a tad, so my apologies. I thought the brief was to actually figure out what we should do to study the upcoming election, right? That so true. that's what I focus my attention on a little bit. So if I may indulge you a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then time permitted, we can talk about the role of ideology. And I'm a boring empirical political scientist. I go from the sublime to the ridiculous, and as 
Niels Bohr said many days ago, science progresses one funeral at a time. So once Ashu and I are dead, right, maybe there'll be some progress once Priyam and, you know, Gilles have taken over. But until then, I guess we'll have to wait, Ashu, I'm sorry. But my concern with Indian elections is very different. As an empiricist, I'm going to say things that may surprise you. Is I think there is so much we don't know. It is amazing how much we do not know. And for me, it's more important what we don't know. And it's important for us to understand what we don't know, because we talk a lot. We say a lot of things, but there are many things we have, to some empirical standards, we have no assessment. And I'll talk about what those things are. But before I do that, let me begin by saying, what are the things we know? You know, make the start news, and I'll get to the bad news first. What do we know? I think we know one thing. There is robust two-party competition at the local level. In fact, it may surprise you to know there are very few strongholds in Indian elections. And in fact, two-party competition is quite robust at the village level. We have data for about 400,000 polling stations. That turns out to be remarkably true for many of them. So that's the first thing. It also, if you just think about it for a moment, just a brief moment, that also means that unless the villages are divided into two castes, you need to build multi-caste coalitions starting from the ground up. And if you need to start building multi-caste coalitions starting from the ground up, you need to think about how people are going to build those coalitions. Okay? And those coalitions are not necessarily built around these vast, large categories of OBC, Dalit, you know, upper caste. That's not how it works, but that's how we like to present it. That's the first thing. Second thing we know is that there is turnover. There is turnover among politicians. There is turnover among candidates. And the third thing we know, these are things we know, and the list of things we don't know is very long. The third thing we know is that there is robust party democracy, which means party labels matter. Individual candidates qua individuals no longer win elections. It's extremely difficult. That number has plummeted. So there are, these are the three things we know. And frankly, that's all we know. Right? What is it that we don't know? And let me just talk about a few things we don't know and things I think we should think about, and then I'll say how we think we can do it. So first thing we don't know is, we don't know why people turn out to vote. We have no idea. Mukulika Banerjee has a book, and people have random spattering arguments here or there. I have no reason. I do not know why people turn out to vote. Who is turning out, in what percentages, and why? We can give some numbers. We can give some estimates, but we don't know why. And those of you who've seen Newton will start asking yourself, is that the reason why people vote? Right? But I do not know why people turn out to vote. And I think that's a really, really important question for us to ask. For instance, we do not know why women are voting in, in greater numbers. I can give you five hypotheses, all of them untested. We do not know this. Right? We, uh, we have no idea. So that's the uh, first thing we don't know. Second thing we don't know is once people have turned out to vote, who they are voting for, right? So does the campaign actually make a difference? Do we know? Can we provide me any estimates or any sense of saying, okay, if I say this or if I say that or if I do this or if I do that, it's going to increase my vote share? I don't know. And frankly, Indian politicians don't. The only thing they know is that they're surprised when they win and they're surprised when they lose because they have no idea what's going on. Seriously. I, we, we have no idea for victory and loss. So if they don't know, right, I think we need to figure out what's going on here. Are the, does the campaign actually make a difference? And if it does, how does it make a difference? Where does it make a difference? Why do, what kind of campaign messages are going to work? What kind of appeals are going to work? And what kind of appeals are going to work in what area? Right? I Frankly, I've not seen any good systematic work on this. So we don't know what the campaign effects are, right? Everybody is spending a lot of money on campaign, lots of ads, lots of TV, lots of, you know, what, what are these things called in newspapers? These paid news. paid news, right? All kinds of things. But we don't know if it makes a difference at all. The third thing we don't know is, does leadership make a difference? Does it actually matter who the leader is? There is some argument, yes, it does matter. We have some, some clues. But why does leadership make a difference? Does leadership make a difference because somebody is charismatic? Does leadership make a difference because somebody is ideological? Does leadership make a difference because somebody is just the big man? Right? We don't know. Or does, some, or does it make a difference? Does leadership make a difference because this person is actually on the grassroots working as a social activist people and can bring people together who are poor? We don't know. 
So, for instance, everybody talks about leadership. Everybody talks about the Modi effect, the Rahul Gandhi effect, the Indira Gandhi effect, the Jawaharlal Nehru effect, right? But we don't know if it makes a difference and how much difference does it make. If I took this guy away, would the election have been the same? I don't know. We can guess. We can use surveys to come up with some kinds of estimates that Rahul and I have done and lots of CSDs people have done and Shields written on this. But it's, we don't have a robust estimate for does leadership actually make a difference. <coughs> so, is it cultural? Is it ideological? Or is it just the big man hypothesis, right? Is it that I'm a man of the people versus I'm the king, right? And I think this election will be an interesting um, election, for, election for that because the man of the people has transformed himself into a ruler. Right? And the question is, which of these actually makes a difference and how much? We don't know. It will be interesting to find these things out. Then does government performance make a difference? Do you know? We can have all kinds of hypotheses. Oh, they so-and-so has won a second term. Why they won a second term? Well, they won a second term because the government is performing well. Really? What about comparing it to local coalitions? What about comparing it to party fragmentation? We don't know. Right? So that's one more thing we don't know. We also don't know and I think this is the most interesting part of this, this of, of what's happening is how the turnout of women is actually changing elections. Is it changing elections? Is it not changing elections? Is it doing the same things? Are women reproducing the same patterns as men? I don't know. Right? Are their voting patterns identical? I don't know. Right? Maybe somebody here does, but there are these are the things to me which we don't know and we should be thinking about hard for 2019 or 18 or whenever the election is going to be held, right? We also don't know much. We do know that the attitudes of the youth are different, somewhat. And we know the attitudes of the youth are different on issues of Hindu majoritarianism. Hopefully, the attitudes of the youth are different on intercaste marriage. But the question is, does it translate into voting? We don't know how these youth are behaving. What's going on? Is, youth, is the youth vote actually a reflection of the vote of, that mirrors the vote of you know, people like me? I don't know if that's correct. Right? By the way, in India, youth is 40. What is the upper limit for youth in India? I think Rahul Gandhi still considered young. You're young, so okay, 45. No, young right now. Huh? 34. Oh, very good. So, so there's still hope for me. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. So, you know, so, so those are the things we don't know. And I think the reason we don't know these things, and I'll give a reason why, and I'll provide a solution what I think we as a community should do. The thing we don't, the reason we don't know, this is we don't have a theory of the vote. In places like Western Europe and in places like the U.S. where I live, there is a well-established theory that tells you there is a baseline for which you can predict what the vote of any particular group, any particular individual is likely to be. You can predict that. We don't have a theory of the vote. And until and unless we develop a theory of the vote for India, it may be regionally specific, it may be group specific whatever whatever it may be we need to have a well articulated theory of why people vote the way they do then we are going to do what i think is the most difficult task of all and i think all social scientists love this all journalists love this the media loves this which is trying to predict the vote how many votes do you have in the in, in the indian national election one right if I remember right, you just cast your ballot once. Some of you may be lucky enough to cast it two times or three times, but I cast a ballot only once. Now I'm trying to explain one single event through a multitude of factors. It is a very, very difficult task. It is an extremely difficult task, especially when I don't have a baseline understanding of what makes people vote A vote and B why they vote the way they do. Unless we have a baseline understanding that we can all agree upon, any exercise we do on election studies, election voting is, quite frankly, hit and miss. Right? Sometimes it will work, sometimes it will not work. You will say something, I will say something, somebody else will say something, there will be a big noise and big mush and everything will fall apart, which is what's been happening until now. Now, it's not all hope is not lost, of course. I think there's a way forward. And the way forward is very simple, and I'm going to put pressure on CPR and TD, what's the, what's the acronym? TCPD. TCPD, close to a political party, I wonder why, okay. So, right. so, so TCPD and CPR, I actually think what we need to do, and this I think should be done in some ways, is the reason we have a theory of the vote in Europe, the reason we have a theory of the vote in the US is there are common data sets that people 
and the intellectual community can share. We do not have that in India. We don't have data sets that are available for people that everybody can write on, that everybody can work with. It doesn't matter who it is, where they are placed, so that we can actually develop a base of knowledge in which we can criticize each other and we can work with each other. And I think it's really important if you're going to study elections for 2019, 2024, 2020, what you choose, what you will, unless we develop a base of knowledge that is shared and common, this is not going to work. We have some election commission data, but that's aggregate data. It can answer some questions, but not others. So I would suggest there should be a group of scholars. They should put together a data set. That data set should be made available immediately after the survey for use for everybody. And since you one doesn't want to be colonized by people like me, which I can understand, there should be a requirement that you should have an Indian co-author, a co-author based in an, in, in an institution in India, so that Indian social science can also flourish. So I think it's really, really important that we develop common knowledge and shared knowledge. Because without that, we'll be having the same conversation in pick, pick your election, and we'll be still no, have no clues as to why A party won and why B party lost. right? And we'll just be talking around in circles. So I would suggest we need to move, and we need to move now. So thank you, and sorry. Thank you, Pradeep, for that uh, fabulous account and uh, uh, pointing out both what we know and what we don't know, which is a very helpful starting point for thinking about how how one should begin to collect data and and uh, and, and the questions that we ought to be asking. Aditi, can I turn to you to add, I think, to that list of things that we don't know? And uh, you know, from a reporter's perspective, what are you learning from the ground that could perhaps uh, give us some beginnings of explanatory variables for uh, the, the list of things that we don't know. So I'm a reporter, and uh, by definition, extremely shallow. Uh, I find myself deeply intimidated by this, this gathering here. And at the best of times, I'm not a very, I'm quite a shy person. So it's, uh, please forgive me if I stutter somewhat. Um, Basically, we are reporters and we go out in the field and we look at a problem and we just stand and admire it. And then we write about it and we come back home and we tell you, this is a problem, I mean, how are we going to look at it? I went uh, to, the, uh, to the Karnataka uh, uh, election campaign to cover the campaign. Uh, I avoided Bangalore and I went uh, largely to coastal Karnataka and North Karnataka, uh, which is a very interesting region. And uh, I'm going to divide what I'm going to say in two parts. Uh, the first is what I saw and felt and heard uh, in uh, Karnataka uh, during the campaign. And uh, the second part is going to be the more interesting part. Let's speculate a little bit about what's going to happen in the 2019 election. So, uh, and this is going to be based on uh, bazaar gossip uh, mostly and, uh, you know, what we gather from politicians and from uh, lobbies and from industrialists and uh, policy makers and so on. So the first part of it, I found three things in uh, Karnataka that I'm uh, quite uh, puzzled about. The first is that I don't know how many of you know about Madhvacharya. Madhvacharya was a... a, a a saint, uh, uh, Margi, uh, and he um, uh, basically uh, spoke about Dvaitvad. Uh, more than that, he established uh, the Ashtamargi, uh, they are Krishna worshippers, so they, he established the Ashtamargi eight uh, uh, points of uh, worship in Karnataka, uh, Puttige, uh, in uh, Pejavar, and so on. Uh, these eight, later on, during our time, became important centers of social assertion, of uh, political influence. Uh, the Pijamar Swami, for instance, uh, was one of the founder members of the Vishwa Hindu Parishad. He's a very influential person. Uh, and also enormous amounts of land and money and so on, uh, not the least of it fueled by diaspora and you know various uh, techies who've gone to Karnataka but are who've gone to the U.S. but are uh, Madhvas. Uh, so the way the 
religious uh, rituals are conducted in the Udupi temple in Krish, uh, in uh, you know the Krishna temple in Udupi, which is the center of Madhvacharya's uh, thinking and Dvaitvas, uh, is done by rotation among eight uh, different muts. And these rituals have been evol have been evolving over a period of time, and they are uh, typically fairly. Um, uh, I mean, they are derived from the scriptures and from Hindu traditions, etc. Now, uh, the last Pejavar Swami, who was just uh, given the, it's called Pariyai, the, the conduct of ritual is called Pariyai. The last Pejavar Swami is a guy, uh, 83 years old, uh, called Swami Vishwesh Tirtha. And uh, he is a, an extremely charismatic character. He came to Delhi and he called on Modi days after Modi was elected. Modi promised to visit there, and he, uh, you know, they are uh, they were in touch very closely in the run up to the 2014 election. Uh, and uh, so he's a he's very much in the thick of things. He speaks half a dozen Indian languages, speaks beautiful English and beautiful Hindi, and is a great uh, aficionado of uh, crime fiction. So that should give you an idea. He also hosted an iftar in the precincts of the Krishna temple and has done some pretty radical, taken some pretty radical steps to uh, do, uh, to allow Dalit entry into the temple. Dalits are allowed, of course, but they are fed separately from the Brahmins. So uh, he's quite an engaging uh, person, but very political and frankly quite devious also. So um, uh, he, uh, he, he was the head of the Pejavar of the network of eight, and he was to hand over uh, to another one, and then that guy would hand it over to another one, and so on, so that there would be no break in ritual Hinduism. Uh, he had a deputy, and the deputy's name was Vishwavijay, Swami Vishwavijay Tirth. He was, as a young boy, he was adopted by uh, the Pejavar Swami, by the elder Swami, and uh, went through all the things. He had to take a vow of celibacy, etc., and went through all the training that uh, is given to priests and went through intensive study of the philosophical uh, tracts and so on. Now, the break comes, the, 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 the twist in the tale comes in 1987 when uh, Swami Vishwavijay is, uh, is uh, invited to the U.S. Now, rituals, according to... Um, According to this 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 sect, uh, anyone who goes abroad crosses the seven seas. It's called Sagar Ullangana. Anyone who crosses the seven seas is debarred from taking on the rituals because God knows, you know, you may have tried, uh, I don't know, Chateaubriand, thinking it's uh, soya bean. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, so you really don't know what you've been up to. So they uh, are uh, quite careful and they, they follow this quite strictly. The Swamiji, who is the dissenter, told me that he took permission from the entire pantheon of all the eight to go on this foreign sojourn. He spent four months in the U U.S. I asked him how he enjoyed himself. He said uh, uh, it was uh, very interesting and I went to Las Vegas and uh, did some gambling also. So, gambling. gambling. So um, now uh, he's also quite an interesting and quite a uh, quite a captivating character, actually, quite a naughty person. Um, so uh, so anyway, he uh, when he when the others found out that he has done this, he has gone abroad. Then they turned and they said, "Sorry, you've gone Sagar Ulangana, you've crossed the seas, so you cannot become the next Pejavar Swami." This Swami was not going down without a fight. And we must remember that uh, Vishwesh Tirtha and this whole, this whole sect, this whole group of eight, uh, was very active during the emergency. They stood up against Indira Gandhi and they stood up for, you know, uh, they stood up against the muzzling of the press. So uh, this man said that, look, this is wrong. I took your permission and I have violated no sacred uh, whatever it is. I did puja. I don't know how many other times they do it. And uh, so he said, sorry, I am going to be the next uh, Pejavar Swami, and if not, then I am going to let the cat out of the bag, which he did by filing a case in the district court of UDP. First, no lawyer would take his case. Then he finally, quite a resilient guy, he went to a lawyer who was somewhere else outside, because 
the pressure of uh, peer group and you know elite and all that is quite tough so he decided that he would a lawyer finally took his case and when i met the lawyer he told me that he was being he, there was a lot of pressure on him but he was being faithful to his profession had softer so then uh, the case was that there should be uh, according to laws extant laws constitution of india what the constitution allows you to do and not do the, there should be codification of the way uh, succession is managed in these temples and this was i mean there was consternation in that place because typically the managers of the estate properties of, and they are considerable they are quite large uh, is the mama or the chacha or the cousin of the swami ji and uh, in one case when i was in mangalore i found an ad which said that the icici bank was about to take over the shirur mats property because the swami ji had hypothecated that property against uh, the a loan taken by one of his followers and so that and that guy had defaulted so the property was about to be taken over there was an ad in the in the paper so now all this is going on and uh, this seems to be a, a major revolution what is the impact this is going to have on other uh, such uh, sampraday elsewhere we know about akshardham we know about the swami narayan we know about uh, tirupati we uh, we know about many others these guys are very wealthy and uh, they are uh, this i mean there's a lot of cronyism so if one guy starts asking questions will this lead to another kind of uh, there was a movement called the satya shodhak samaj so will this lead to another satya shodhan in uh, that samaj i don't know but i was completely struck by the the extent to which uh, the, the 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 people who you would not whose no ordinary society would not question the extent to which he was ready to go to establish what he felt were his democratic rights and accountability uh, in a system so that's one thing that case is going on for whoever wants to follow it and i can have happily give you the links and you can follow the progress of the case and the swami ji also keeps uh, sending me stuff on whatsapp so i'm <laughs> i'm like really in the thick of it um the second thing that confused me was uh, hub uh, hubli which is actually the granary of karnataka uh and has this fabulous soil it's black you can see it it's it's beautiful soil but has been going through a drought for the last two years uh farmers are by and large wealthy and uh, they paid uh, to the Uh, to the to the government or to the insurance agencies uh, as part of the pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana uh, a premium of 83 crore was collected just from the hubli area because farmers thought you know coverage is so low and if i if the crop fails then i at least i'll get some money from them and so on when i went for the election this was the second year of the drought and there was a lot of uh, distress many people had committed suicide uh, because they were not able to they were not able to basically just live and uh, they said that the area has got uh, 29 crore we have paid 83 crore and we've got only 29 crore as compensation so they said if the pradhan mantri comes here and talks about pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana we will throw stones at him uh the interesting thing is that there is karnataka has a tradition of very strong and militant uh, farmer protest uh from nanjuna swami to i mean farming and farming practices is progressive and it's it's got a very strong uh, farmer movement and yet there is so much distress and there's no farmers movement so what's going on i really don't know uh the third thing that i have to report is that i went to a uh, hubli family court to understand what is happening to families uh the most striking thing there was the petitions for divorce uh now this is a i think it's a interpretation and data problem also because uh divorce data in in india 
has been collected only after the 2011 census. Before that, uh, divorce and separation was treated together. So you really don't know how much is separation. Separation is actually three times divorce, but people don't want to say they're divorced, so they say they're separated. So which is divorce and which is uh, which is uh, separation, we don't know. But uh, anecdotally, it was very clear that the rate that more and more families are uh, divorcing. And then I read an article in EPW, which is, you know, the Bible of our times. And uh, I found that uh, they had made a very, some anthropologists had made some uh, uh, quite important point, which is that the, the gap between rural divorce, the rate of divorce in rural areas, or the rate of dissolution, as it's called, in rural areas and urban areas is just 0.5%. Um, so that was the other thing. So these are the three things that I saw and I heard, and I thought I'll just tell you. Uh, now as to the 2019 elections, let me tell you anecdotally, quickly, point-wise, what uh, we are hearing. Number one, 50% of the BJP's MPs are no longer going to be fielded by the party. Uh, so you're going to have a situation where uh, it's going to be a kind of a new party with new faces. Uh, many of them are going to be professionals, and this exercise is going on as we speak. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, uh, an internal survey is going on. The BJP will submit its uh, first set of reports on performance of MPs uh, before the monsoon session, which begins on 18 July, and after that we will get more information on what uh, what is what the thinking is. Many of the very senior people, including uh, um, uh, the MP from Kunti, Kariya Munda, for instance, who is 82, is not going to be repeated. Advani ji, probably at 92, is not going to be repeated. Uh, Muri Manoj Joshi is uh, Rajya Sabha anyway, so he doesn't count. Uh, Sush uh, Sumitra Mahajan is probably going to yield place for her son, Mandar, uh, and so on. Uh, so I'm not sure even the BJP knows who it is going to who, who they are going to field, but it's not going to be these guys. Uh, in the Congress, there's a big uh, debate about what to do on alliances. If you enter into alliances, you limit your own growth in those areas. You can't possibly argue against a party with whom you are in alliance. But then you allow the BJP to come in. So this debate is going on and on and on, and there's no sight of it ending. Uh, in BSP and SP, also there is a debate, but BSP, I think, is uh, likely to take a, a kind of a subdued role. And the, what I'm hearing from the bureaucracy is, what's the point of going to Delhi? Might as well stay in the state and do our work. There is widespread demoralization and widespread, uh, you know, what's the point of all this? Apart from roads and, uh, well, to some extent uh, now, uh, education and health, uh, very little seems to have been done. We can go into a long debate about why and what the mistakes were that the BJP may have made uh, from our standpoint. But that's the situation as of now. I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditi. That was absolutely fascinating.